for uh, the folks who are stepping in and stepping up in areas of their passion and areas of their giftedness and um, working with our children, working with our preschoolers. And, and uh, God, we just pray that you'll bring increase in that ministry. Uh, we are thankful that we know that our kids are being taught how to be uh, warriors, how to be um, effective prayers, how to be effective soldiers for the kingdom of God. And uh, we just thank you for that, and we pray a blessing over them. We pray for, for uh, every child who, uh, who is in, in a Sunday school class this morning or a church service somewhere, that they would realize that, God, you came for them uh, now, not, till, not when they get older, um, but now. And uh, I thank you that there's no junior Holy Spirit, that the same Holy Spirit that lives in Jaden lives in me. I'm so thankful for that. And uh, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would continue to move with us, through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning we're going to continue on in our study of spiritual gifts. And um, there are times that you, you as a pastor, uh, you wonder. Let me just go ahead and say, you know, all of us have a responsibility about um, church attendance. Uh, you have a responsibility for your own self to, you know, to, to find a church that you can't live without and then go to it and commit to it and become part of it. Um, and then church leadership, those of us in leadership, well, we have a responsibility to make sure that when you get to church that there's something you get that you really need and not just, uh, you know, make you feel good, but just something that will help you get through the week. And for those of you who are regular attenders, well, your responsibility is when you see somebody who's not there, you, you reach out to them and you let them know, hey, man, we miss you when you're not here. And uh, so, so we all have a responsibility in this thing. Um, and, and we all have gifts. And all of our gifts work in um, concert with each other. And uh, so I, I just want to really encourage you, whatever your gifting is, um, know that you are, uh, he, God chose you to have that gift. It wasn't like he was looking around for somebody to give this really super cool gift to, and you were the only one standing there, and he's like, oh, okay, I'm just going to have to give it to that person. He picked you out. He hand-selected this gift for you, and so it's important that you use this gift as if the King of all kings and Lord of all lords and creator of everything chose you to do what only you can do for him and through him. So I just want to encourage you in that. Um, for those of you who are wondering today, I know that I'm always a spiffy dresser, but today I especially dress this way in honor of James West, who, uh, if, you don't, if you didn't grow up watching Wild Wild West, I'm sorry. Uh, the uh, Will Smith movie was a travesty, I'm sorry, but, uh, um, but we all know that James West has been uh, trapped in a box before and left for dead, and he always got out. So I'm not sure that Robert Conrad is actually dead, but I dress this way today because I wanted to honor him. Um, when I was a kid, if I didn't have boots, now a lot of people in South Florida have boots, just so you know, we have, we have horses and cows in Florida. And, um, and th I remember the year that I didn't have boots, but I wanted to play Wild Wild West that day. And so I put on my best dress shoes, and then I took the bluest socks that I had, and I pulled them up over my dress shoes and all the way up. So to me, I thought I had on boots. Of course, I knew I didn't. Um, <laughs> My mom always wondered, how did these socks get ruined? And uh, I never told her, but um, it's, it's, it's kind of a cool thing. I've had a great week. How many of y'all have ever gone to something that you thought, uh, I don't know if I want to go to that, but then you go and you're like, man, I am glad that I went to this thing. Um, Worship City Alliance is a, is a group of, of pastors and uh, uh, they, they meet in, in Nashville, they meet at One Stone Wednesdays at 9.30, which is kind of a strange time anyways. But um, this week, I was like, you know, I really I need to go. I need to connect with those people. It's at One Stone. Uh, Mark, uh, Mark Lancaster and I are, 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 are friends, and, and uh, I always want to support him. I never know when my own kids might be leading worship, so, you know, I went. Uh, I was there. The only other two people that I knew, other than Mark, was Denise Hughes and, uh, and Eric Sample. And some of you all know Eric Sample, and, and uh, I think Eric and his wife were on the worship team at the original vineyard here in Nashville. And um, so, so I'm sitting there, and uh, <clears throat> the guy, as the guy begins to speak, and he reminds me of Mel Brooks. Um, 
Uh, but he is, uh, he's an older gentleman, and he was speaking on the prophetic, and he was speaking about identity, and uh, he kept saying, and, and I, I positioned myself about where Jill positioned herself. I'm not at like, the very back row, but about as far back as I could get, where there was actually nobody behind me. Because, you know, uh, believe it or not, I don't draw attention to myself. And uh, so I'm sitting back there, but then he keeps saying, at the end of the message, at the end of the message, at the end of the message, I, I hope to do some prophetic speaking over some people. And at that point, I'm like going, Holy Spirit, this would be really cool. But I ain't going up there and asking. But if he comes back here to me, that would be awesome. And so um, he kept, kept talking about this book that he had and, and uh, how, many, you know, how many pastors do we have. Well, I was one of three pastors in the group. It was a small group, but I was one of three pastors. And he said, well, I'm, I've got a book for you afterwards, so come over to the table and I'm going to give you this book. And I'd already decided I was going to buy the book. And so, uh, you know, he gets to that point where he's beginning to do some prophetic words and everything, and I'm the last person he comes to. And I was like, yes! And, but it was so cool because, you know, he was just speaking some things over to me. And Sally's going to type that up because maybe you'd like to know what's been spoken over your pastor. It was pretty cool because one of the things that he said, um, and this ties in with the Wild Wild West thing, was have you ever gone onto a ranch and you know how there's that sign over the ranch, you know, big, big, big circle uh, ranch or whatever. And my first thought was the first time that I ever met Kevin and, uh, and, and Keenan which I know Sally was the first one to see Keenan and go, ooh, he's cute looking. He looked like a surfer dude. It's not exactly what she said. Close enough, Keenan. But I was the first one who introduced them uh, because Keenan came riding up on his four-wheeler. It's like, that's not a horse. Um, but but there's, a, there's a sign. Was it, was it originally Green Acres or was the man who owned the farm green? But it was originally Green Acres because... Um, and I don't know if Kevin told me that or if I just knew that, but, but he said, he said, you know, you ride under that thing. He goes, he goes, your, your sign, they're about, they're about to put another sign up there, an additional word that you're going to be known for. You're going to be known for something different than, than what you've been known for. Now, how many of y'all know that's actually kind of exciting? You know, it's, it's nice that you, that I'm, I'm not, God's not done with me yet, that this is not as good as I'm going to be. I know a guy told me one time, he goes, Mike, this is going to fry your brain because of your personality, but you are not as good as you're going to be. And he was right, because I was like, you don't like me? That, that's not what he was saying. <laughs> that's, that's not what he was saying. He's just like, you've not finished. Can I tell y'all, every person in here, from the youngest to the oldest, and I won't point out the oldest, you're not, God's not done with you. No, Steve. I won't even point out Steve Lowe, uh, although I just did. God's not done with you. God has, God has more for you to do. That's the reason we're spending time talking about spiritual gifts, because if you're convinced that my gift doesn't matter, and, and I don't really have to show up, and I don't really have to be involved, let me encourage you, you're wrong, because there are things that only you can do. God hand-selected you to do certain things. There is somebody waiting for you. Now, this isn't guilt and shame. This is just encouragement that there is something, there's an assignment for you out there. God hand-picked you to do something, and that's exciting. When, when, you, get, when you get left, you know, when, when they're choosing teams and you're the last one to get picked, or you don't even get picked, why don't you just keep score? You know, that's not very good. You, you are the first one to be picked for this assignment. That's pretty cool. So what is your spiritual gift? How does it fit in the body? And that's where we're going to go today. So today's, uh, today's spiritual gift is, is the gift of giving. Now, g- giving is the number sixth gift in our church, which means we have a lot of givers. Now, let me tell you all, I love my church. And uh, I, would, I would rather have a church this size with this many people who are working for the kingdom than a church 10 times this size with people who don't even, they, they have no clue. They're just, they're just trying to find a place to hide. So I, I, I'm, I'm encouraging you and you encourage me. So, um, you know, Jesus tells a lot of parables. And what are parables? Parables are, 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 are stories based on the truth but they aren't probably actual events. But sometimes Jesus would would teach us and tell us about actual events. He would show us actual events. And so the gift of giving is one of those where Jesus Jesus talks about giving, and and, uh, and he does something really cool with his disciples, and that's where we're going to start, is in Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. 
So he sat down opposite the treasury and he began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury. Many rich people were putting in large sums. A poor widow came in and put in two, co two small coins, um, which, uh, which, which amounted to a cent. Calling his disciples to him, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all their, all their contributions together to the treasury. For they, they all put in out of their surplus, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she owned, all she had to live on. Now, Jesus had just had several run-ins with the religious leaders, and um, they, were, they were, themselves were guilty of taking advantage of this very widow. And yet she shows up, and as, a, as an act of worship, she gives the last that she has. <clears throat> and we see that several times in the scripture, where somebody will give the last that they have. And uh, as I understand it, the, uh, the, the way that the, uh, you know, we use this glass jar, and uh, they didn't use a glass jar, um, although I'm sure they probably thought about it, because then you could see the money go in there, but, but they would use this, they would use something that when you threw the money in, it made a lot of noise. The more money, the more noise. So you could, you, you could, I'm going to quietly give money. And then you're, you know, you're like throwing it at it so it reverberates all through the temple. Oh, man, that guy's giving a lot of money. You hear, you hear all that money hitting there. Well, they, why'd they do that? Look at me, look at me, look at me. A person with the gift of giving is not saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. As a matter of fact, most of the time when they give, it's extremely private. It's extremely quiet. It's extremely hidden. So, so Jesus, Jesus tells the guys, guys, listen, she has more of a gift of giving than all those people who gave way more than her because she gave out of everything that she had. Now, the more generous you are, the more you can give. I believe that God blesses us more so we can be a greater blessing to other people. I, th I think that's cool. But don't think you have to have surplus in order to be generous. As a matter of fact, if the only time you're generous is when you have a surplus, you're not really generous. Okay, you're giving out of your excess. Um, you know, we, uh, we, we, I think we talked a couple of weeks ago about if, if Bill Gates decided to write our church a tithe check for what he makes in a half a minute, we would gladly take it. We would put him on the, we'd put him on the email list, but, um, but it wouldn't affect his life. He, is, he doesn't care. You know, he's, gonna, he's not going to miss that. He's not going to have to t turn his cable off, you know, if he, if he gives us a, a tenth, a tithe or something. But, but giving isn't about your excess, it's about your heart. And so God has given certain people the spiritual gift of giving. Now, uh, in Acts chapter 4, uh, there's another person, and, and we've already kind of talked about this when we were talking about um, uh, just some, you know, the, the, the gift of uh, uh, exhortation and then the, the gift of discernment. But um, now Joseph, a Levite, of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement. So he, was an ex he had a gift of exhortation as well as the gift of giving. And he owned a tract of land. He sold it and he brought the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, Joseph seems to be on the other end of the social spectrum from the widow. Joseph had land to spare. And he just said, you know what, I'm going to take this piece of land, and I'm just going to sell it, and I'm just going to go, and I'm going to give it to... Now, I don't think he did that so that people would notice, but the word got out, and a lot of times that happens. Uh, the word gets out that somebody's made a donation or something like that. But, but that, that wasn't the reason he did it. He did that because there, was, there were needs. He saw a need, and he go, you know what, I can meet that need. I can sell this thing, and I can, and I can meet this need. And so that's what he did. So that's the, the two extremes of... The person who's extremely wealthy, or at least very comfortable, and the person who is uh, on death, on poverty's door. Um, and he gave this, and he sold the property, and it had absolutely no strings attached. Uh, how many of y'all have ever been in a church where they actually had a policy that you cannot just designate your giving unless the church voted to have a certain uh, uh, giving designation. Let me say, let me make it. Okay. So we decided we were going to buy a church organ and somebody comes up and says, well, I want to give money to that organ because I, I love organ music. And so, you know, because the church had established a, uh, a special fund, you know, you could give directly to that. But what we found at one church is that we had to actually make that be a rule because what was happening was people were controlling where their money went 
because that was the best way they could control the church. So I'm designating my money to go to the staff person that I like. Well, you know, that was great for that staff person, but the rest of us were like, <laughs> what's going on here? But there were always strings attached. I remember uh, uh, the, the church that Sally and I got married in Forest Hills Baptist Church. There was a lovely couple 